1 Peter chapter 3. You know, in our study of 1 Peter, throughout the study, we've talked over and over again about how we are to live differently among those who are not, uh, not Christians. In Peter's book, he refers to those as pagans. And a lot of times when we mention the word pagans, we get this picture in our head of these people who are dancing around in circles naked, making sacrifices and all this kind of stuff. We tend to think of pagans as being really weird, really bad people. But I think in 1 Peter, pagan is just his term for people who do not know Christ. They're not Christians. And that doesn't necessarily make them bad people. They may be our best friend. I mean, how many of you have really good friends that you're super close to that aren't Christians? Yeah, absolutely. As we saw last week, these people may actually be our spouses, people that we're married to who don't know Christ. And so when he says live such good lives among the pagans, uh, he's not talking about we have to be a completely 180 different from them. We just have to ex ex uh, exhibit to them a different response than what the rest of our world has around us different from the way that people who don't know Christ respond and to show them uh, that we do know Christ based upon our responses. And I've also talked a few times about how our Christian response to what's going on in our world around us must be different than what we see on the news and on social media. And as I said before, in whatever circumstances, Christians must behave differently. And as I read through our text that we're going to be in this morning, there was the line in verse 14 that really kind of struck a chord in me. It said, do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Now, if you're using the NIV, you'll notice that there's a footnote on that, on that verse there. And if you look down in the footnote, it suggests that it may be translated, do not fear their threats. And, and Dr. Black, in his commentary, suggests it may be best understood, do not fear the fear they try to produce in you. So it's not just what they fear, it's what they try to get you to be afraid of. Do not fear that. And when I read that and was kind of re reading some notes on that, it, it got me to thinking, and if you really think about it, fear is a very great motivator for angry outbursts, for poor responses to what's going on around us. You know, fear creates in us that fight or flight uh, response. And a lot of times, instead of just running away, we fight. And that's what causes a lot of what goes on in our world around us. If you think about it, what happens every four years in our country when we elect a new president it is driven by the fear that fear motivates the riots and the mobs and the protests and the social media rants. People are afraid of what's going to happen if the other side gets into office. <clears throat> and I want you to listen this morning to a quote I came across. It's on the Psychology Today's website. It's written by Manuela Barreto. She's a PhD, and the article is titled, How Does Fear Affect Our Social Lives? And this is what she says. Although coming together has been shown to result in fear, and then we understand that when we're afraid, we kind of get together with those who are like-minded. So although coming together has been shown to result from fear, fear can also pull people apart. Most obviously, people will try to distance themselves from those whom they fear, and they often fear those they do not know. For example, people from different racial, religious, and national groups often fear one another. Fear might even cause people to derogate others they would not normally be afraid of just because they are somehow different or unfamiliar, often referred to as an outgroup. And she makes reference to something that happened in the UK. In the UK, they had some terrorist attacks. And they noticed that after those terrorist attacks, that uh, there was a lot of hatred that was uh, addressed towards people with, with disabilities. Even though the people with disabilities weren't a part of the terrorist attack, the fear that the terrorist attack caused made everybody be fearful and attack those who were just different in some way. And then she goes on, and this is one of the quotes I really want you to listen to. She says, many politicians intuitively know this, and build fear into their rhetoric to encourage social tribalism. Now, I've been reading another book. It's called The Second Mountain. 
And the guy talks about how in our society today, we've become very tribal. And it's funny because I've noticed over the years, a lot of young people will refer to their family and their friends as their tribe. And I always wondered where that came from. And he says that, that our culture is moving into more of a tribal nature. And he said, which sounds kind of neat on the surface, but it's really got some very negative underlying connotations because tribes war against one another. If you're not a part of my tribe, then you are the enemy. And he said that our society has become so much this way that if you're not a part of the Republican tribe, you are the enemy. And if you're not a part of the Democrat tribe, you are the enemy. And we've all seen this. And, and again, back to the quote that, that she makes in, in this article, many politicians intuitively know that fear builds this, and so they build fear into their rhetoric to encourage social tribalism. And they do, and they are wise to do so, she says, as messages inciting fear are twice as effective at polarizing votes as messages without fear. Now, I want you to think about all the political stuff that you've seen, and doesn't all of it have fear in it? If we elect this person, our world's going to fall apart. That's to create fear. And we're all being molded. We're all being shaped. We're all being manipulated. The reality is fear can polarize. It can lead us to an us against them mentality. And it can lead us to fights. But as Peter has said over and over, this is not the response for Christians. For us, our response must be like that of Jesus. And if you go back and read the Gospels, you're going to read that three times on the night before Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he went to God and he asked, he pleaded, would, this, would you remove this cup from me? You see, church, I've long believed that Jesus was fearful. He, he trusted God, but he knew the human thing that he was going to have to go through. And I think that the human part of him was afraid. And yet, as Peter says in chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus was able to submit, was able to do this because he trusted in God. And this is what Peter keeps instructing us over and over again through his letter. And that's what his message is to us this morning in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. In verse 8 and 9, he says, finally, all of you... Be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Peter is concluding here uh, the teaching that he began back in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good works and glorify God on the day he visits us. And everything between there and where we are this morning, he's been teaching us how to do that. And one way we do that is living in harmony with one another, being sympathetic, loving as brothers and sisters, being compassionate and humble. I believe Peter is saying this is how we're to treat one another, not just within the church, but even those outside the church as well. And he has to put this in here. You would think that if you're writing to the church, you don't have to tell the church to get along with each other, wouldn't you? Because we're all Christians. We should just treat each other this way, but Peter knows that that's not the real world. He has to put this in here because we allow all the negativity and all the fear and all the anger and everything else that we deal with on a daily basis out in the real world, we allow that to come into the church. And so we have to be reminded every so often how we're supposed to treat one another. Because we've all seen what happens when Christians don't treat Christians the way they're supposed to. We've seen churches split because they didn't live in harmony with one another. We've seen recently what happens in our country when we don't live in harmony and treat one another this way. We've seen marriages fall apart when we don't live in harmony with one another and treat one another this way. 
And even though Peter doesn't use the verb be submissive that he's used throughout this section, all of these qualities listed here have a submissive attitude involved in them. But again, we allow fear to creep in. And often that causes us to react in inappropriate ways. And so Peter uses a quote from Psalm 34 to kind of help us put this into the proper perspective. In verses 10 through 12, he says, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to, to turn with me to Psalm 34 this morning because we're going to be uh, reading through that here in just a moment. In, in my Bible, it's got a little heading above Psalm 34 that says, Of David, when he feigned insanity before Abimelech, who drove him away and he left. Now, this is referring to an episode that happened back in 1 Samuel chapter 21. If you want to go back and read that, you can. I'll tell you a little bit about the story this morning. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, David is fleeing from Saul. Saul wants to kill him. And David is fearful of his life. And so he flees from Saul, and he goes to the land of the Philistine. Now, you think about it. I want you to think about this. David had spent most of his adult life warring against the Philistines. He had killed Goliath. Remember that? And then there was this song that they sang. Uh, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And church, those tens of thousands that he killed were Philistines. David was probably not real popular in the land of the Philistines. Amen? Amen. And yet that's where he flees to, which may kind of indicate how fearful he was of Saul and how fearful he was of his life. So he, he flees to the land of the Philistine. But this turns out to be one of those out of the frying pan into the fire kind of things because the king of the Philistines recognizes him and says, isn't that the guy that they sing the song about? Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. Evidently, that was kind of one of those crossover pop songs, you know, that crosses over not just in different charts, but in different countries, too. And so the king recognized him. And now this puts David in a, in a situation. He's fearful. What's going to happen now? Are the Philistines going to kill him? Are they going to torture him? Are they going to take him into custody and turn him back over to Saul and let Saul do the evil work? Is David going to have to fight all of these Philistines just to try to get out of there? Is he going to have to resort to violence once again? But you read the story, David escapes. And then he credits God with his escape. He trusted in God, and so he didn't have to fight. What he actually did, and this to me is kind of weird, is he humbled himself and he pretended to be crazy. He wrote weird stuff on the walls, and he let the slobber drool all down his beard and everything like that. And finally, the king looks at him and says, Why do you guys bring me another crazy one? we got enough of these. Must have lived in Washington, D.C. Anyway, uh, so anyway, so David leaves. But, and we may think, well, he just pretended to be crazy, and that's what got him off. But David says, no, it was God. God actually delivered me. And listen to what he writes in Psalm 34. He says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord like no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you 
the fear of the Lord. And if you've ever wondered, what does it mean? What is the fear of the Lord? David said, I'm going to teach you. This is what the fear of the Lord means. Whoever loves, whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That is what it looks like when you live in fear of the Lord. You watch your mouth. You watch your tongue. You watch you, what you say. You seek peace and you pursue it. And then he goes on and he says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Those that do those things, those are the ones that God sees. Those are the ones he watches. And his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their trouble. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them through them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His eyes are on those who fear him and do what he wants them to do, which is to turn from evil, to do good, to seek peace and pursue it. And Peter has called us to this over and over and over again, to do what's right in God's eyes, even though the world tries to make us afraid and tries to get us to just respond like the rest of the world. Even in times of hardship and suffering, Peter tells us over and over again, do what's right in the eyes of God. And he continues in verse 13 through 15. He says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? That's a rhetorical question. And the answer would normally be no, no one. No one's going to harm you if you're trying to do good. But that's not the world we live in. We know that even though we're trying to do good, there are always going to be people who try to harm us, even because of that. And so he goes on, he says, But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. And then he quotes from Isaiah, Do not fear their, their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. And I'm going to stop right there for this morning. Peter takes his quote from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12. Uh, this is another place where there's fear. God has told Isaiah that he's going to bring destruction on the people who have rejected him, and it's going to be catastrophic. There is fear there. And I want us to read what, what Isaiah says in chapter 8, verse 11 through 17. This is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. God always says, do not follow the way of those that don't know me. That don't fear me. He says, do not follow the ways uh, of, of this people. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Boy, now, if that's not applicable in our time, I don't know what is. Do not fear what they fear, or as Dr. Black says, do not fear the fear they're trying to produce in you, and do not dread it. And why shouldn't we fear these things? Because the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble and they will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up this testimony of warning and seal up the Lord, God's instructions among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Isaiah says, you're not supposed to fear what the world fears. You're not supposed to fear the things they're trying to get you to be afraid of. All you have to do is fear God. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to fear God? Well, David has told us. 
That's to make sure that we keep our mouths from saying the wrong thing. It is to seek peace and pursue that. That's what it means to fear God. Don't get caught up in all the stuff that's out there in the world. And that's what Peter is constantly reminding us of. Our reverent fear is in God. He says here, in our hearts we set apart Christ as Lord. And if we keep that foremost in our mind, we have no fear of anything this world throws at us. We're free from the fears and worries of this world. They no longer have control over us. So we can live a submissive life. We can live in harmony with one another, being sympathetic, loving as brothers and sisters, being compassionate and humble. We no longer have to repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Instead, we can be like Christ and repay evil and insult with blessing. And Peter says, if we will do this, we will inherit a blessing. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word that tells us how we should act in a world where everything seems to be driven by fear and chaos and conspiracy. And Father, we know that we must be different. We must be a light in the world of darkness that's going on around us these days. I pray, Father, that you will help us all as we encounter negative accusations and negative threats and all the negativity that comes on us. Father, just help us to pause for a moment and remember that our fear is only in you. And that means that we must behave differently in all circumstances. Father, help us, those who are gathered here this morning, those who are watching over the internet, help us, Father, to be a light in this world today. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Another song before the Lord's Supper.